almost all engines, except for the 143-145 HP D4CB diesel engine, have almost direct analogs among Mitsubishi units, but are not completely compatible with them, and constant creeping changes add confusion. The quality of the materials is not very high, so the motors require constant monitoring and replacement of small cheap consumables, and most of the fasteners here are disposable. However, the prices are not very high. Particular attention should be paid to the cooling system. Leaks due to leaky tubes of heaters and autonomous are a common thing. The only gasoline engine on the Hyundai H1 is the G4CS of the Sirius family. In fact, this is a Japanese 4G64 in a version with a single camshaft for 112-118 HP with a little modernization from the Koreans. The problems are exactly the same as on other Mitsubishi models, for example, on the first generation Outlander. First of all, this is a timing mechanism with a drive belt for one of the balancer shafts. The belt is weak and thin, and it breaks on age motors often due to wear of the balancer bushings or oil ingress. Its remnants, in turn, finish off the timing belt. He is thicker and usually passes his 60,000 kilometers calmly. A typical refinement is to turn off the balance shafts altogether. To do this, modify the oil pump and remove the drive belt. Otherwise, this is an excellent motor, strong, with good maintainability and even tuning potential. For example, you can find examples of installing a cylinder head with two camshafts and even supercharging. Diesel engines can be divided into two families. The first is clones of the Japanese 4D56 engine, an 8-valve swirl chamber turbo diesel with a mechanical fuel injection pump and a timing belt. Derivatives of this motor have indices D4BF, D4BH, and D4BA in Hyundai. The most powerful developed only 103 horsepower, and this is rather a boom. The second family is mostly the Korean D4CB engine with 143 to 145 HP with a completely new common rail power system, timing chain, 16 valve cylinder head and long awaited hydraulic compensators. All heirs of the Japanese 4D56 have at least a few specific ancestor problems. First of all, this is the timing design with a balancer belt, in fact, the same problem as the gasoline 4G64. Only for a heavily vibrating diesel engine are balancers more relevant, and given the mileage, problems with balancer liners are more common. The design of the timing, even without taking into account the problems of the balancers, is not the most successful. Here, over time, the rockers fall, and the valves need to be adjusted often, every 15,000 kilometers. It is advised to change the belt every 50,000 with a complete set and not save, but at the same time make sure that oil does not pour on it. Oil leaks are the second most common problem. The motor is leaking oil from all the cracks, and this can only be dealt with by a complete overhaul with the replacement of all gaskets with new ones, and often with the repair of the piston group. The third trouble is that the massive piston group is quite fragile in practice. Catching a piston crack due to overheating, overblowing, or a leaking injector is easy. At the same time, a fair amount of pistons makes the motor completely not torsional. It works like a typical truck. 3.5 thousand revolutions for it is almost the limit. Usually, any troubles with overheating and overflow are also complicated by a broken cylinder head gasket. You should carefully monitor the presence of gases in the expansion tank. And by only the highest quality gaskets. And during repairs, it is imperative to check the planes of the block and cylinder head for distortion and damage. With runs of 300 plus and manual gearboxes, you also need to monitor the crankshaft liner's operation at very low speeds under load kills them for such a run with almost a guarantee. Let's add here a mechanical injection pump, which is not very cheap. Rapid wear of injector nozzles and smoking due to them. The risks of cylinder head cracks and smaller problems like the need to regularly replace the damper pulleys, the low life of mounted units due to the very high amplitude of torsional vibrations, the not very reliable generator with a built-in mechanical vacuum pump, and we get not the most successful engine, but quite suitable for truck or minibus. With all this, there are instances with runs over 400 and without major repairs. 
The old-fashioned design has its advantages, but it is very demanding on the quality of service and its intervals, and as a result is not cheap. In addition, the vibrations are quite strong, and the fuel consumption is on average 10 liters per 100 kilometers, even in highway mode. Special thanks to Hyundai for not installing newer 4D56 variants with common rail, a lower compression ratio, and a reinforced crankshaft and piston pin on their cars. Because the options for 116 and 136 horsepower from Mitsubishi proved to be not very reliable and durable, their block even cracked, and the life of the piston group was short. Which is not surprising, since the maximum power speed was raised almost to gasoline 4,500. It is the new reinforced engines that are responsible for most of the negativity regarding the 4D56, and they have nothing to do with the N1. The new D4CB motors got rid of belts, the cylinder head became 16 valve, and the valves do not need to be adjusted thanks to hydraulic lifters. The progressive common rail power system made it possible to increase power to 140 odd forces with a more confident start in the cold season and at the same time reduce fuel consumption along the highway by almost one and a half times. It would seem that all problems have been solved. But no, the engine turned out to be quite capricious. Hydraulic lifters really don't like dirty oil and start knocking, and if you ignore the problem, you can get lifted camshafts and pusher shafts. The timing chains, there are three of them, are quite strong. They run 150 to 250,000 kilometers, or even more if there are instances with runs over 300. But they really don't like high speeds and a rare oil change. They can make noise much earlier during urban operation. In winter, cars with high mileage and chain noise often break the oil pump drive chain if the engine is turned over to a cold one. There are also chances that the oil pump itself will jam and the chain will be secondary damage. A clogged oil intake is very harmful to the oil pump. It is here with a fine mesh, and it is better to check or change it every time the chains are replaced. The oil pump itself should be preventively changed at a mileage of 300 plus, especially if the liners or hydraulic lifters were worn out, it has no performance margin at all. Very early, with runs of the same 200,000, you may encounter wear on the crankshaft liners. And with runs of more than 300,000, problems begin with the liners of the balance shafts. Turbines Garrett 1752S on this version were not very reliable and much more expensive than Mitsubishi TD04-9 or Borg Warner BV43-2074 on 4D56 any drop in oil pressure leads to their failure. But in general, the resource is acceptable, they can pass 200,000. True, the price of a Garrett cartridge from Chinese manufacturers is low from 90 to 120 euros. The nozzles are more expensive than simple mechanical ones on the 4D56, but they serve their 300,000 regularly, and nozzles do not need to be changed, although the nozzle rings burn out quickly with frequent use of full power. The vacuum pump is reliable, ensures the normal operation of the brakes and the connection of the front axle. The intake throttle is needed for EGR operation, but is useful for engine braking and to prevent overrun, especially since it does not clog with soot. The average resource of the piston group is under 500,000, it rarely serves less. At the same time, the motor does not like high speeds in the same way as old engines, its EGR is more capricious, the heat exchanger or its tube may leak. The EGR valve itself regularly supplies soot to the intake, greatly reducing engine power over time. The intake manifold gasket regularly squeezes out in the area of backslash U200 B backslash U200 B first cylinder. In general, the newer Korean motor is more complicated and much less maintainable than the old Japanese one. And spare parts are noticeably more expensive, which is especially true for mileages of 500 plus. However, it is more economical and provides very good dynamics to the car. Commercial vehicle brakes are usually strong, and the H1 is no exception. Of course, for a car weighing over 2 tons, rotors with a diameter of 274 mm are not such a great achievement, but in theory such a car should not fly, and a professional should be driving it. 
In practice, the service life is quite acceptable due to the large area of the pads and the two-piston caliper. Moreover, the caliper serves better than on Korean crossovers and often the first repairs begin after 10 years of operation and then usually due to unsuccessful maintenance. The service life of the pads is very good because their thickness is increased by at least a couple of millimeters compared to passenger cars. Disc brakes at the rear are also a good thing. If there are drums on the rear axle, then it doesn't matter. They also last a long time and are quite reliable, and the parking brake drive in any case is made like a car, with cables. But there are a couple of nuances. ABS is optional here, and often, if it is available, it does not work. The second option is worse than the first, if only because the stability of the car when braking in this option is very low, and a new sorcerer costs from 120 euros, and a used one in normal condition is not found in nature. The second feature is the unusual fastening of the front brake discs, they are located from the inside of the hub, so to replace the hub, you need to remove the hub, and then carefully separate the disc from it, which is often associated with careful work with a sledgehammer or a press. At the same time, you can replace rusty ABS rings and bearing seals. In general, there is a lot of work, and there is a chance of breaking something along the way. Brake pipes, of course, right after 10 years of operation, first of all, as a rule, the rear ones. The front suspension of all versions is double wishbone with torsion bar. The rear depends on the modification and year of manufacture. Until the middle of 2001, all versions had a continuous bridge on springs at the back, and after that, and only for passenger minibuses with a short base, a bridge on springs, and with a guide vane of five levers. The front suspension is made with a fair margin of safety, and the maintainability of the design is very high. Among the spare parts there are even support cups for the body. Well, compatibility with the Porter Light Truck allows you not to worry about the availability of spare parts in stores. On early machines, ball joints need regular injection, check this when inspecting and purchasing. However, even with maintenance-free ball joints there is usually something to do with your hands. The characteristics of torsion bars are gradually disappearing, they are very sensitive to overload, their attachment points do not like corrosion, the splines can be torn off at the most inopportune moment, and the adjustment mechanism turns sour, and there is often a center of corrosion on the frame in this place. So check for unauthorized welding when buying. The front levers are strong, but 10 years later the metal gives up at the attachment points of the ball joints, the holes break and corrode, like the installation sites of the silent blocks. The lower arm sometimes loses geometry due to age, overloads, and bad roads. Yes, and the attachment points to the body with runs of 500 plus often have to be welded and changed. The rear suspension is in any case solid and more of a cargo design. It is believed that since the spring version is structurally simpler, it is also cheaper to maintain. But in practice this is not entirely true. There are wear parts in addition to the springs themselves, such as silent blocks in the ears of the springs and in the shock absorber mounts. The springs themselves are not eternal, they require maintenance, overhaul, and replacement, especially with regular overloads or frequent trips on dirt roads. The rear axle beam has a limited resource. Corrosion undermines the ears, the attachment points wear out. And the welding should be carried out very carefully, because the beam can warp during local heating, and then the bridge will have to be sent to a specialized service. And what is most unpleasant, the cargo spring suspension is not only in design, but also in terms of characteristics. With it on uneven pavement, an empty car can shake the soul. It even comes to reworking the suspension for air springs in order to improve the smoothness of the ride. The variant with five levers and springs looks more complicated, but in fact it is easier to maintain. The guide vane itself in the form of rods and levers is stronger, even with heavy wear of the silent blocks, there are no distortions and problems with stability on the road and the operation of cart and shafts. He does not need complex adjustments, only a very strong blow can damage the levers. In addition, the car is softer and handles better. The resource of silent blocks is large, and they are changed very simply and quickly. As a result, the chances of expensive and lengthy repairs are significantly less. 
the steering on the H1 is conventional power steering. The pipelines are rather weak, and the pump is not extremely reliable, but the whole mechanism usually passes its 300 plus without serious breakdowns if you do not forget to change the oil. Rack wear, knocks and leaks are associated either with torn rack anthers, high loads and dirty oil, or with runs over 500. It goes without saying that non-original hose clamps and inaccurate repairs can lead to leaks and pump hum with less mileage. Like many other Hyundais of those years, the Sterex slash H1 has rusty axle shaft splines. The problem is especially relevant for all-wheel drive vehicles, where the splines on the front axle shafts are still located next to the working surface of the roller bearing. In the event of corrosion, you will either have to change the axle shaft or sharpen the bushing on it, otherwise the bearing life will be very small. The splines of the cardan shaft also suffer. But the rear axle was lucky, where the axle shaft is assembled with the hub. The reasons, as usual, are in poor lubrication and weak axle shaft seals. Well, the quality of the steel is also not the best. The CV joints and universal joints themselves are quite reliable, they are easily repaired, everything is disassembled and assembled, if not sour. The bulk of the machines are equipped with manual gearboxes, they are found here in two types. For old diesel engines 4D56-D4BH and gasoline 2.4G4GSD4CB, a 5-speed M5ZR1 is used. For the new D4CB diesel engines, a more recent M5SR1 gearbox was installed, and all all-wheel drive vehicles have the M5UR1. Despite the apparent diversity, and with all the differences in the bell and body, and even the switching mechanism, all manual gearboxes are based on the old Mitsubishi V5 MT1 box, with which they even retain partial compatibility in terms of clutches and synchronizers. Boxes of these series do not like fast switching, synchronizers suffer greatly from this, as well as buildup. So, you can get a box wedge when quickly switching from rear to first due to the shift mechanism. The second typical problem of these MCPs is weak seals, so after 200,000 leaks are very likely, and the farther, the more abundant. But if you don't skimp on maintenance, fix leaks and change gears without unnecessary zeal, then the design is conditionally eternal. The only annoying thing will be a loose switching mechanism both due to the backlash and due to the fact that the fastening of the rocker to the body gradually comes off. And the last point. Cars with the M5 SR1 gearbox usually have a dual-mass flywheel, an element that wears out and is not cheap. Automatic machines on H1, other things being equal, are more reliable than mechanics even 400, and more than a thousand can easily depart before overhaul. This isn't such a surprise, since the A44DE slash A44DF is a good old Eisen AW03-72LE that has been carrying chasers, Altezes, crowns and marks with Hilaxes for over 20 years. And until 2002, the no less legendary A340, aka Eisen 30-43LE, was installed on the Korean built Sterex slash H1 with a diesel engine. At one time, Hyundai received access to these boxes as part of a cross-licensing agreement between Mitsubishi and Toyota. In general, breakdowns of boxes of these series come down either to a dead torque converter, GDT, or to friction wear. A breakdown of the gas turbine engine usually leads to overheating of the box and leakage of the box seal, and at the same time to a clogged valve body. And almost always the result is a dead pump and the need to flush everything from the remnants of the adhesive layer of the locking clutch. Well, with runs of 350 plus, you can already finish off the overdrive direct forward and low reverse packages, but this is more common with SUVs and those who like to start with a haze. Repair usually involves finding a contract unit, they are also available for Korean cars, but are not as common as for Japanese automatic transmission options or still in the bulkhead, but using the Toyota box as a donor. Moreover, even on a set of clutches, from 70 to 80 euros, they usually save money, because a whole box with minimal mileage with a little luck turns out to be the same or cheaper. And if among the breakdowns is an expensive oil pump or its bushing, then there are simply no options, they cost from 150 euros and will still be used for this amount, 
but it is not known from which unit. All-wheel drive on the N1 is the simplest, hardwired, so-called part-time. A simple transfer case and hubs with vacuum control in the front axle. The transfer case lasts a long time, as do the driver shafts, and their breakdowns are mainly associated with failures of the vacuum system, operation of all-wheel drive on hard surfaces, or simply with 300-plus mileage. I already mentioned the front axle splines and bearings above, in the suspension section. The vacuum valve is a consumable, it is poorly located and often has to be replaced due to corrosion. Collective farming using an idle air valve from a VAZ2105 with the number 21050-11270-1002 is very common. Interestingly, the Ziguli analog turns out to be almost more reliable than the original. Outwardly, the cars often still look good if you do not come closer than 20 meters. But the vast majority of inexpensive specimens will have serious body problems from paint bubbles on the doors, roof seams and windshield frame, especially in the lower part, to missing arches and sills. Single copies of garage storage or those simply in the same hands and without a lot of mileage can please you with their pristine hardware and decent appearance. But even with an outwardly decent condition and a price of more than half a million, be prepared for the fact that there is no rust on the driver's door sills and the side sliding door, the bottoms of the doors themselves have rusty streaks from the inside, and there are swellings and spots on the edge of the hood and under the rear door seals wry. Cars with plastic door and sill trims rust more than those that do not have them to begin with. The plastic only slightly masks the beginning of the process, but the dirt accumulated behind it greatly accelerates the formation of holes. Often the mileage on cars is such that even the chrome mirror brackets rust. If a beautiful outwardly car turns out to be in its native paint, then this is a miracle and this is the H1 of dreams. But this is rare. From the good news, despite the fact that the body is formally load-bearing, all its external elements are minimally loaded, all the loads from the chassis are taken by the frame, so. External rust is not a sentence if you see a living frame from below, with hole spars, sills, suspension attachment points, torsion bars, spring ladders, and the bottom of the body itself. Such a car can be forgiven even for rotten body sills and sliding and driver's door sills. But usually if it rots, then it is everywhere, and often just a completely prosperous outwardly specimen rots from below to holes in the supporting structure. Primary attention should be paid to the elements of the integrated frame itself, its longitudinal lodgers, attachment points for units, and suspension. The metal is thick, but that doesn't help. Leaky and cracked longitudinal spars are not uncommon. Slightly thinner power elements in the form of struts carrying thresholds, a panhard rod bracket and other transverse elements, as well as interface elements with a motor shield, engine compartment mudguards also thoroughly rot, especially at the locations of the technological holes. Special thanks must be said to very sketchy lockers, which in fact do not cover anything and only collect dirt. Often, during inspection, secondary power elements can be pierced not even with a screwdriver, but with a finger. The thin metal of the outer and inner parts of the thresholds, front panel, arches can simply disappear, turning into a sieve that barely holds its shape. So disappears the piece at the rear of the arch and the metal mudguard along the vertical body panel. The rack between the spar and the floor of the body also suffers. It is here with a window for the torsion bar service and rots around the perimeter. Even the front levers rust, despite the very thick metal, they can be bent due to loss of strength or pulled out at the installation site of the ball joint. In the step of the driver's door, the bottom and the threshold itself disappear. Body floors rot along the longitudinal spar, especially near the mudguards of the rear arches. The front mudguards and internal arches rarely rot, but in the rear part the lack of normal ventilation of the cavity under the sound insulation effects, especially on vans where there is no rear heater, but there is always a lot of condensate. In general, the Hyundai H1 needs to be inspected even more meticulously than the 20-year-old Ziguli because you won't find a fresh body for it at the nearest metal acceptance. And not all elements can be welded in place from tin plate, a different term should be used here, but you understand. And the body parts on the H1 are not cheap. 
but, on the other hand, such machines are needed for business, and after a rough but good repair, the power structure will withstand its five to six years. Unless you get into an accident, of course. In general, absolutely everything can be broken, especially with runs under a million and a hired driver. And the Hyundai H1 is an excellent confirmation of this. Broken handles, mirror brackets, locks, bumpers, headlight mounts, windshield wiper actuators simply indicate that the life of the car was not easy and the owner was greedy. Almost everything is on sale, albeit not very cheap. But the original parts are strong enough, cars with private use are usually doing well. Yes, and Chinese parts are in stock because the car was produced there until 2018. Other people's hands, attitude is a tool and huge runs do their job. Finding a good and serviceable salon is difficult, but possible. In general, everything was done well, although cracks in the dashboard, loose plastic elements of the front panel, the gearbox rocker coming off the floor speak of some miscalculations by the designers or of their misunderstanding of the specifics of the Russian operation of such machines. In practice, these are trifles that are not worth much attention. The main thing is that the sliding door mechanism is quite strong and can be repaired, although the outer handle is relatively fragile. The materials for the passenger versions are well chosen, its 300 plus thousand interior is kept even by minibuses and transfers. Of the unambiguous shortcomings, an extremely gentle performance of the climate system with two stoves and air conditioners. The air conditioner is often simply turned off, since the restoration of all the tubes and two condensers costs 40,000 odd even when using used spare parts. And the system itself is capricious, which is not surprising given the use of two expansion valves without balancing. The stove system is being restored using metal plastic tubes, clamps and radiators from gazelles and ziguli, as well as various hoses. The original steel tubes under the bottom usually look unpresentable by 10 years of operation, and if the antifreeze is rarely changed, they begin to leak, as well as heater radiators, especially the rear one. The presence of autonomous heaters in the system only multiplies the number of problems. Unfortunately, the list of problems does not end there. Strong people manage to tear the climate control damper cables, and the absence of filters greatly pollutes the inside of the front air conditioning unit. Well, the resource of fan motors is limited, with runs of 300 plus they were restored at least once, with an unpredictable result. A simple wiring diagram and a very oak truck style wiring are great for the owners. Almost all elements are perfectly repaired and diagnosed. But broken corrugation of the back door, the driver's door, faulty locks, broken dashboards, and fragile wiring in the engine compartment are typical cases. And in general, the electrics for the H1 are not as important as the condition of the body and power plant. Of the serious problems and unsuccessful wire from the generator, it breaks just under it and the very fastening of the generator on diesel engines. It here differs from Mitsubishi not for the better. It breaks the lower support, the tension bar bursts, and sometimes breaks off the ear of the generator when it is skewed. Let me remind you that often we are talking about 500 plus runs. The specifics of operation and the age of the first generation Hyundai Sterex slash H1 are such that you need to choose not a modification, but a specific instance that has not yet been staggered to the state of scrap metal. And yet, other things being equal, cars with more modern diesel engines and spring-loaded rear suspension look the most human-friendly.